Hello, and you're very welcome to the Hoth Spirituality Channel. Mm-hmm. Today we have Sally Highland with us. Hi, Sally. Hi, hello. Um, thanks very much for agreeing to join us today. You're very welcome. And Sally, um, could you start maybe by just telling us uh, how you would define yourself as a believer? What words would you use to describe yourself? As a believer? Well, I really believe in, in God. I believe, I suppose, mainly in the person of Jesus Christ. Um, I think I have a very personal relationship with him. Uh, I think he was a very compassionate person, very caring. Um, I have a particular interest in the marginalised and, you know, so therefore I I get great inspiration from looking at the Gospels and the way he treated the poor and the homeless and people who are in need. I think there's huge need for that in, in, in the world today. Okay. And would it be possible for you to kind of explain to us uh, the evolution of your belief and, and when it first started, if you can remember back? Right. Oh, I can remember all right. Well, I was born into um, a very Catholic family. Um, we, we, we lived a few doors away from the church in Lismore, County Waterford, and... Uh, the church bell actually was our signal to get out of bed in the morning and we went to daily mass and we had very religious kind of parents. We had family rosary every evening and, you know, we attended anything that was devotional in the church. We grew up like with the Legion of Mary and all those different associations. And um, we kind of enjoyed it, you know. We didn't object to it, you know, and um, and then um, oh, I had in my family. I had two aunts who were missionary sisters, and I suppose I was always inspired by them. Um, one was Franciscan, one was Sister Saint John of God, uh, and then I, I suppose I went off to college and. You know, having a well, a good time and thought everything was grand. And then I was teaching and then I was actually coming home from school one day and I thought to myself, um, there must be more to life than this. Coming home from school from... From teaching. And as a teacher, as, as a an teacher, adult teacher, yeah. 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 And I, I just happened to be reading at the same time this book called Late of I Love Thee. And it had such an impact on me that uh, I realised... Gosh, you know, maybe I have a religious vocation. So I I uh, contacted Sister St. John of God and eventually joined them. Can, can you, is it possible to remember the, the, the effect the book had on you and what it was about yeah, the, the book, book and what it said I, to you? I, I, I can't remember the exact details of the book, you know, but um, I do know it's a quotation from St. Augustine. Um Whatever it was, it was probably all part of a like a symphony that was going on in my head at the time, and um, and the, and therefore I ended up in you know John God sister in Wexford, and so after that I uh, had some formation for a few years there, and then I came to teach in Dublin, and uh, oh yeah, while I was in Wexford, uh, I came in contact with charismatic renewal. And I thought it was fantastic because it gave me uh, it, it gave me a great love of scripture, which I am passionate about, and I, there was great joy in it, and um, it kind of fitted in with uh, my thinking that. Uh, what the good news is, you know, it's John's Gospel, t- you know, chapter 10, verse 10, I've come that you may have life and have it to the full. We're meant to, you know, enjoy the fullness of life and meant to appreciate who we are and, you know, that we're, you know, I say in Corinthians, we're God's work of art and that we're meant to live the good life, the here and now, that the kingdom of God is now, it's not something into the future. It's how we live every day. Um, 
and how we apply our our spiritual life, you know, to the to the reality of every day. It's about uh, appreciating. Well, for me, it's about appreciating uh, God's love in the depths of my own being, and that when I'm aware of that, then I can also be aware of it in other people. I can appreciate it in others. God's love in the depths of your being. Yes. Can you say more about that, about how you recognise God's love, what it is? I think, well, I think, you know, it can only be realised, I suppose, through prayer and reflection and taking time, being aware. Um, And I think... It's about allowing ourselves to be touched at the deepest part of who we are. Um, Particularly, I think, in times of silence, that um, God's presence is there. I also think that um, um, his presence is very evident in nature, all the different aspects of nature, you know. I think beauty is luminous with God, that it's, it just reflects back to us, you know, we are reflections of God and it reflects back to us who God is. I think all the arts like music, poetry, theatre and film, you know, uh, all creative things, all creatures, you know. That's why I love um, the Pope's encyclical, you know, Laudato Si. Um, recently published because uh, he, what he says there is like that all of nature, all that is created is like a big symphony of wonder. Um, and that's what I try to appreciate that every day as far as I can. I taught in Kilmore Road for 12 years and then I moved from there to a volunteer to go to Cameroon, West Africa. So um, there the Gospels became even more real for me while I was there. Can you explain that? Um, I suppose generally um, people were poor and circumstances were bad and um, you know the people were very Ill, living very poor lives and um, they were very open to the word of God and they accepted it you know some of them unconditionally for example um, there was a group of women that I used to work with and um, um, coming up to Easter time, I showed them a little bit of Zeffirelli's um, The Life of Jesus. And they didn't understand all the French, but they were following the story. And they, when it came to Mary, you know, following her son to Calvary, those women were weeping because they were so identified with, you know, the mother. And so many of them would have lost children. You know, children, the child mortality rate was quite high in that area. So for them, it was, it wasn't a story. It was so real. And um, so many times like that, you know, occasions, different occasions like that, that I felt the same about the sower going out to sow the seed. Um, I was involved in, in several kind of agricultural projects and um, and went out, you know, sowing seed with people. And um, during the dry season, it would be like desert, you know, it would have absolutely fallen, you know, nothing, there'd be no growth. And just so many examples, you know, um, of like, you know, where another example, say, of Jesus, you know, the woman that was bent over for 18 years and... Um, I suppose because we had uh, education and we had knowledge and uh, we had resources, you know, we were able to help so many people, you know, to like 
just to stand up straight in dignity again, you know, mainly through education there. We had a policy there that um, we'd walk beside the people. We wouldn't, like, you know, just gift them something. We'd, we'd, we'd walk beside them. They had to own the projects, whatever they were. Uh, and we walked beside them. And um, it was just amazing to see, uh, for example, uh, people who, uh, you know, who, who, who couldn't read or write. And, and suddenly, you know, they were coming into another world of um, education or appreciate, particularly women and girls, you know, because it was quite a vast area um, where no girls had ever gone to school. And uh, and so, you know, even if you if you went to ask them a question, they'd kind of step back and, you know, they weren't worthy. And so our thing was, you know, to work, to give them dignity, their own personal dignity. And um, I saw a lot of that and it was really humbling and inspiring and... And then once they would grasp it, they would do it for the for others themselves. So it was great. And and um, what was it like for you then to return to Ireland? Awful. It was so difficult to come home. Um, it was more difficult to come back than it was to go out there. Uh, I just loved it out there. I loved the people and. I, uh, it was such um, it was like virgin territory you know to to walk with people who were in need and to be creative and you know um, it was so difficult to come back uh, because here we live very much in kind of a hazard free society in general and uh, we're so well off and we're so blessed and we're, we don't realise it and it was very difficult to come back and hear people complaining about small things um, I suppose you know it's it's you know eventually I suppose you, you start getting back into it again you know it's very difficult to find uh, meaning I suppose when you come back again but, um, you know, suppose after a while you just have to readapt. And Can I ask you, Sally, about your daily religious or spiritual practice? What does that involve, if there is a sort yeah. of a daily practice it's, element? Yeah, um, yeah I, I try to... Um, as far as I can, all, as far as I can all day, as... Um, to hold a kind of consciousness of God. Um, I pray, I say morning prayer, you know, I, prayer of the church. How long does that take roughly? It takes, it depends, it could take me five minutes or ten minutes or, you know, whatever, I might pause during it. And then I usually pray approximately an hour a day I, I meditate or contemplate on the word of God for the day, the gospel of the day. Um, except like if it deals with divorce or something like that, then I choose a different passage. I just pray quietly with it. And again, it depends, you know, sometimes it's very, I find it easy to just be, try and be really still and um, listen to God deep within myself. Other times I could be more distracted, but I would keep trying to refocus myself. Or I might just read the Word of God really slowly, you know, several times. I would, as far as possible, go to Mass every day. And um, I would pray evening prayer. And I would try to... Um, you know, if I was going to meet somebody or if I was, um, I see people for spiritual direction and that, uh, I would always pray for them for a few minutes before they'd come. So what goes on, Sally, when you pray for someone before you meet them? What's happening at that point? 
what I'm, what I, what's happening is I'm trying to um, put myself into a kind of a sacred space in that um, I ask the Lord to bless that person that's coming and to bless me with that person so that I will be really open and listening and attentive to them so that it's that the center of my attention is the other person with one ear to God and so that I'm not the focus you know that it's other focuses on the other person and um, that I'll be able to hear what they're saying and also maybe what they're not saying um, and so that you know simply that I would be open to them in whatever way they need it and what's your personal experience of that sort of work what's that like for you doing that sort of work oh I think it's I have great um, belief in it um, I think what's really important is that we each have a personal relationship with God and that the basis of that is having proper self-esteem oneself, realizing how much we are loved within ourselves, first of all, by God. And that's what changes everything. That's what makes us kind and compassionate and uh, non-judgmental and, you know, all the things we aspire to be. Can I ask you, Sally, what would you say to somebody who would believe that they can maybe achieve those sort of goals without maybe a, a belief in God, if someone thinks they can achieve I kindness think, or compassion? Yeah. or mm -hmm. Well... Carl Jung had this great phrase written over the lintel of his door. I think it's also on his grave that bidden or unbidden, God is always there. And that's my belief too. And um, Carl Rahner, you know, the theologian, developed that in great detail. You know, he said God is consciously or unconsciously, God is there. And wherever there is goodness or wherever there is search for authenticity or for love or appreciation and depth i think that is they're all the vibes for me of god my rod for measuring all is the gospel and um they're like christ broke so many taboos and you know you know he spoke to the woman at the well and he had this you know that was his longest longest conversations in, in, in the New Testament with this woman, you know, and he shouldn't have been talking to her because Jewish men aren't allowed to talk to Jewish women in public. And um, like she, she had this whole personal journey in those few minutes or however long it took. And she became that lady who was so disliked, obviously, in her village. She became like a missionary. She went, you know, racing back to the people who actually disliked her, you know, saying, I've met him, I've met, I think it's the Messiah. And they believed her because of her conviction. They knew something had happened to her. And they came out in their hundreds. And he stayed with them, you know, and, 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 and then there's another shift there again. He said, they believed First, because she told them, she invited them out, and then after that, they believed because they'd actually met him themselves. And I think that's what it's, it's all about, being, having that inner energy that's creative, that can give life, that's healing, and that, um, you know, can give hope in the midst of, you know, the many problems that are in our world today where there's so much despair and, and, and so much loss of life through, through suicide and through crime. I think that's where it's the personal, I think, you know, it's that that's going to redeem us. 
It's been fascinating listening to you today, Sally. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. You're very welcome. Thank you very much for inviting me.